It's eight o'clock on the dot here in the Pacific Coast. Uh, my name is Ravi Sivalingam. I'm a machine learning engineer with Qualcomm. And uh, welcome to the next iteration of TinyML Talks. Today, our speaker is John Edwards from Sigma Numerics Limited. And his talk is going to be about low MIPS MEP and memory machine learning industrial vibration monitoring solution. Uh, we'd like to thank, thank our TinyML talk sponsors. ARM is the TinyML strategic partner, DeepLight, Edge Impulse, Maxim Integrated, Pixo, Reality AI, and Synsense. Additional sponsorships are available. Please contact Betty at tinyml.org for more info. A reminder for upcoming uh, TinyML talks in two weeks on Tuesday, January 5th, we have Andrew Baker from Maxim Integrated to talk about the future of personalized connected healthcare. All right, uh, I'd like to welcome John Edwards, our speaker for today. Uh, John Edwards is a DSP AI and Embedded Systems Consultant. He's worked as a DSP engineer in applications such as digital communications, control, automotive, IoT, and AI. He's also been a visiting lecturer at the University of Oxford and presents the digital signal processing course He's a member of IET, IEEE, and a regular contributor to various international conferences. Take it away, John. Thank you very much, Ravi, and uh, welcome. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, this talk today. Um, so as Ravi said, the main um, title of the talk is uh, Low MIPS and Memory uh, Machine Learning Industrial Vibration Monitoring Solution, quite a mouthful. Uh, the subtitle um, is uh, it, also known as uh, Not All Applications Are Cats Versus Dogs on Facebook. And um, it's a bit of a play on um, uh, a, a talk I saw back in the summer, uh, nothing to do with TinyML, where um, some guys had, uh, uh, it was a machine vibration monitoring application, and um, they had some sensors on a rotating machine and uh, they, uh, they took the outputs from the uh, transducers and turned those raw time domain signals into 2D images, uh, which they then uh, trained a neural network to recognize uh, using one of the many image recognition um, algorithms that we probably all learnt AI on. And um, they, uh, for their vibration monitoring application, uh, having trained the, the network, they then had to implement it. And uh, it required a very large um, Xilinx FPGA, very expensive, very high power consumption um, to recognize the images in real time. Um, it was an interesting application of uh, image recognition, uh, but the reality is for many of these types of uh, industrial applications, um, a, a more um, intelligent uh, approach to uh, AI, I think is, is uh, um, going to be beneficial in many of these applications. So today's talk, I'm going to talk about um, an application, vibration monitoring, um, it's an edge AI application, very low power, uh, very low latency. Um, it, uh, it, of all of the applications of um, AI that um, I believe, I, I, I don't believe image recognition is going to be, um, you know, maybe in five, 10 years time is going to be as um, one of the key algorithms. Um, I believe that industrial monitoring um, presence detection, window break detection, all of these kind of applications that use 1D um, audio signals uh, are going to be, uh, be much more common uh, and much more important. So condition-based monitoring, predictive maintenance, all of these kind of techniques are going to become very important applications for AI uh, in the future. So the heart of the talk is going to be about using DSP, digital signal processing algorithms, um, in front of our AI neural network um, algorithms. Uh, so 
before we get into the detail, um, we have a little poll, uh, which I think Ravi uh, is, ah, there you go, excellent. Uh, I, uh, it's popped up on my screen. Hopefully it has popped up for all of you guys. If you could just uh, click one of the uh, four options, uh, then uh, I will mute. And I think Ravi is going to uh, present the, or talk about the results when they come in. So uh, yeah, uh, we're just waiting for pe people to vote. So we'll give them a minute. But uh, it's interesting that you said uh, about converting, uh, you know, time series signals into images and ending up, you know, using a, a very heavyweight image classification algorithm to classify time series. So uh, there is a common thing that, you know, uh, the big advantage of neural networks is that you can you don't have to do feature engineering or feature, uh, you know, uh, construction and that the neural networks, if they're especially several layers deep, they can learn the features that are relevant for the applications themselves. Uh, whereas uh, we're noticing that in, in tiny ML applications, people are, uh, you do want to bring in some domain knowledge. So what, do you have any comments about that? Uh, because I think you're arguing on the side of the ladder is to bring in more domain knowledge rather than too many layers. Yeah, that, 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 that's a great question, Ravi, to lead into my talk, because I will actually be talking to that exact subject in a few um, few slides time. So yeah, perfect, Excellent. perfect lead into to the talk. Yep. And the poll results are up. Uh, it looks like 33% of the audience have programmed DSP algorithms in C or assembly. 25% uh, have developed DSP algorithms in Python, MATLAB or other high level languages. Uh, another 23% have, have done some data analysis in Excel or similar software. Uh, about 20% uh, said they have no DSP knowledge. Excellent, thank you very much, Ravi. Yes, uh, that is uh, interesting results. I, I did a similar talk back in the, um, in the summer to a UK uh, science in industry group, and we had very similar results. So um, yeah, around, uh, 50% have uh, either coded in C or assembly, Python, MATLAB, and so on. So that, that, that's excellent. Um, uh, good. Well, we are, let's get on to the talk. And um, I'll talk about uh, a little bit about the, the uh, initial project that was the, the motivation behind this application. Uh, then I'll talk about the, um, uh, the algorithmic details. Uh, the, and the results, uh, and then at the end, I'll, I'll give a, a, a demo. So um, in terms of the, the project itself, um, it, it was, um, uh, the scope of the project was to uh, try and detect a number of different vibration modes for a uh, rotating machine. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the, the target was to, um, uh, to implement these algorithms on a very low cost um, embedded uh, CPU. And I'll talk about the, the choice of CPU uh, later on. Um, uh, it, it needed to be a scalable solution so that it could support uh, a large number of um, uh, deployments. Um, uh, the initial goal was that uh, it, it should uh, utilize standard AI development processes. And, and again, I'll come to talk about that later on because actually we, we didn't initially in, in the project, uh, but uh, ongoing uh, future work, we almost certainly will. So I'll talk about that, um, uh, intense flow and so on. Uh, the, um, the end customer had chosen uh, ARM as the uh, architecture. So that's, that was the, the, the chosen uh, silicon vendor, if you like, um, for, for this project. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the trade-off between uh, the DSP capabilities and the AI capabilities, part of the project was to evaluate that uh, trade-off and uh, what, uh, what, what um, functionality you could implement in AI, 
what functionality you could implement in DSP to try and reduce the, the cost of the MIPS and the memory are the, the, the basic cost uh, functions. Um, ideally, um, the, well, the, the, the target device, uh, the ARM device, um, was uh, programmed in C mainly. Uh, and there was, there was a, a project goal to try and avoid using assembly code. Uh, and we'll talk about why that, how that drove the, uh, the decision-making um, uh, process. So at the start of the, of the project, TensorFlow Lite as we know it, CM, SIS, N, NN, um, we're, we're both still uh, very much in their inf infancy. And so uh, we decided on a, a pure C um, approach to uh, deployment, uh, but that interestingly drove how we, we did the training uh, for the algorithms. Um, so um, the, uh, as I say, the, the, the application itself was a uh, vibration monitoring application but this uh, techniques that we these techniques that we're going to talk about, um, I believe, are um, going to be very uh, important in a huge range of, of different uh, application areas, not just vibration monitoring. Um, any application uh, where you have one uh, D signals, particularly so, acoustic signals, vibration, uh, speech to a certain extent, but I'll, I'll talk briefly about that at the end of the, the talk, but applications such as medical healthcare, automatic patient monitoring, environmental monitoring, health and safety, logistics, all of these kind of application areas uh, where you're processing 1D signals, um, I, I believe could benefit from these, uh, these techniques. So, John, um, uh, uh, may I interrupt Ravi, with the questions? Yes. So uh, you mentioned that you can use it for uh, speech recognition as well. That is going to be uh, actually my question is, can you use this for like wake word, like keyword detection for waking up a larger or more higher power sensor? Or um, that's, an, that's another great question. So what I'm, when I talk about the algorithms that we use, I will actually, mm -hmm. I have a slide that, that actually answers that question as well. But, um, because um, acoustic applications such as speech recognition um, are a very interesting uh, use case of uh, AI algorithms, but they use a slightly different variant of the algorithm to the one that, that I've used for the vibration monitoring. So absolutely good question. So I will answer that um, in about four or five slides time. Excellent. Um, so, um, why do we want to do um, mach machine learning at the uh, endpoint, commonly referred to as edge AI? I think we're probably all aware of the main driving functions. Lower latency, because you haven't got the uh, internet to um, uh, between the machine and the uh, inferencing model. Uh, it's lower cost, uh, lower power consumption, uh, always on. Um, and there's a security element as well. Uh, in this case, the, the, um, uh, the neural network was connected to a wireless network, um, which could log the results to the cloud. Uh, so there was that network connectivity for the process results. But um, this um, solution could be an entirely standalone solution um, without any requirement uh, for connectivity to, to the cloud. So these are all, uh, you know, good, good reasons why um, edge AI is becoming uh, more important. I would edge machine learning, edge ML. Um, however, the, the key thing is, that, and, and this, is, this is, was one of the driving functions in this project, uh, this moves the cost from the service provider to the consumer or the customer. So the person buying the kit um, has to um, buy the kit up front. So every um, cent that you can knock off the bill of materials for the, the piece of kit obviously has a direct impact on the desirability of that product to the, uh, to the customer. So that's a, that was a big driving function. So the big question, how can we help optimize 
the machine learning vibration recognizer in this app in this application um, to meet these constraints. So let's look at the application from a high level. Um, on the right hand side, we have um, uh, in the middle, in yellow, we have the AI model that we are going to train. And uh, our data is going to come in um, via um, an A to D converter, analog to digital converter, through some pre-processing and into the training engine, which is going to train the model. Um, and then uh, for when we uh, deploy to the field and we're in the predicting mode, we're going to do the same pre-processing, the same feature engineering, which comes to Ravi's question earlier. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the algorithms that we uh, implemented. Um, we do that pre-processing, do the prediction, and then we pass the results to the fault detection engine that, that then um, logs the, the results to the cloud. So the key things, um, I mean, the, the training, the AI model and the predicting, you know, we can all do that in Colab using TPUs in the cloud. You know, that's all very easy, but to be able to deploy it, the, the pre-processing is, is the key uh, capability. So let's have a look at the, uh, the kind of signals that we were, um, we were analyzing. So here are uh, two signals. Um, on the left hand side, we've got the two signals being displayed in the time domain. And on the right hand side, uh, we're showing exactly the same signals, but uh, in the frequency domain. Now, to you and I, we can see the differences between those time domain signals. You know, so to our friends that uh, implemented this kind of approach using um, image recognition, you can kind of see why they did. They, they took those vibration signals, they performed some image recognition on it. But if we uh, look at the, the graphs on the right hand side in the frequency domain, we can actually even more clearly see where the differences are. Um, there is a, uh, a peak here and different shape peaks up at the higher frequencies. This area here, we see higher frequencies. So in the frequency domain, we can much more easily see how the, uh, these different vibration modes um, are, uh, are featured, um, but also, those frequency domain features make it much easier for the AI uh, algorithm to recognize the, the features rather than putting the time domain data straight into the um, AI model. So that's um, one view of looking at the data. And now we'll take a, a, a different view of looking at the same data. And this is a, a view called a spectrogram plot. And um, in the top, we see uh, the data um, with a vibration mode, we, we called it mode one. Um, and you can see that around five, 5.2 kilohertz, there's a very, um, there's some data just showing slightly brighter. So what we've got here is on the X axis is time and on the Y axis is frequency. And then the brightness shows the, the uh, energy level at the frequency. So at 5.2 kilohertz, in the top motor mode one, we're seeing some artifacts showing through. Um, but in the, in the, we called it mode two, in the failure mode, you can see that energy uh, much, much more clearly uh, in the frequency domain. And actually over time that, uh, that, that, that would vary as well. So we could look at the variability of that energy around the five, it was about 5.2 kilohertz um, that that vibration was occurring. So we can see now, just looking at these images, how, how much easier it is for an AI algorithm to recognize uh, the frequencies rather than the vibrations in the time domain. So um, as a, a sort of a DSP geek, when I first started getting involved in this application and I'd, you know, we'd, we'd all learned AI 
by training using images and horses and cats and dogs and all of this kind of thing. One of the questions was, um, could we just take the time domain data, and this is exactly Ravi's question, why don't we just take the time domain data and throw it straight at the AI model and let the AI model do all the work? Well, um, I did a bit of Googling and actually within five minutes, I think I'd pretty much found the answer. And um, I found this uh, amazing piece of work by uh, somebody called Enderlith. Uh, that's their GitHub username. I have no idea who they are, if they're on, or uh, if anybody here knows who Enderlith is, please ask them to get in touch, he or she. Uh, I'd love to give them credit for the work. Uh, because uh, they, he, she, uh, developed um, an AI neural network that uh, would basically um, uh, uh, fit and then predict uh, the FFT of some time domain data. And when I looked at this, I thought, wow, this is awesome. If, if, if that's all we need to do is use Enderlith's algorithm, uh, I can just go, go and sit on a beach somewhere drinking pina coladas and just train these models uh, to learn the DSP algorithms. Uh, but unfortunately, the summary of uh, Enderlis's great work is that it requires an awful lot more MIPS and memory to achieve the same thing um, using an AI model rather than the traditional DSP algorithm, which is the fast Fourier transform, which we are going to look at. So if you've got all the MIPS and memory in the world, then um, this is a great way to go. But if, you, um, if you're resource constrained in terms of MIPS, memory, power consumption, and so on, then um, that, uh, that piece of work you know, really shows that um, we need to separate out the signal processing uh, feature extraction from the neural network um, recognition part of the process. <clears throat> so if any of you guys are interested in this type of field, and I'm sure you are because 50% uh, of you said that you were um, DSP engineers, um, experts and so on. Go and have a look, download the repo and have a play with it. It's a brilliant, brilliant piece of work. And uh, I, I played with it for a, a bunch of hours and, and learned a lot. So um, if we want to teach a, a neural network, um, to learn and recognize vibration modes, uh, it makes sense to pre-process the input data um, to help, basically help the AI uh, algorithm do its work. And I'm sure we are all aware, and Ravi's mentioned it, this, this uh, process is called feature extraction or feature engineering. But what we're doing, talking about today is taking this to the next, uh, the next level. So signal processing is the solution. Let's look at the algorithms. So the key algorithm, sorry, excuse me. So uh, okay. uh, may I interrupt with a couple of questions? Uh, yeah. You know, we, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, one of them is, uh, can the, some of these uh, pre-processing algorithms that you mentioned, could they be actually implemented in hardware rather than running as software lines of code on the processor, on, on the microcontroller? Uh, um, for example, like these FFTs and so on? Yes, actually, uh, so, um, so yes, I've just, uh, I've just called, uh, um, called up the, the Q&A window and I see. So uh, actually the, the device that I'm going to talk about is an SOC. So we actually uh, implemented it on a uh, on an SOC device. Um, so um, and also use VLSI signal processing. I'll, well, okay. So via to the VS, VLSI question, mm -hmm. we didn't actually use VLSI in this algorithm because the device um, has a special DSP accelerator. But okay. yes, um, that's my historical background is VLSI signal processing. So that's absolutely how I would do it if I was to use a general purpose DSP rather than the ARM device that we were using in this application. Got it. 
All right. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're, you're very welcome. OK, so let's go to look at the algorithm. And um, I'm sure um, as engineers and scientists, we're all familiar with the Fourier transform frequency domain spectrum analysis to some some degree. Uh, Fourier's uh, theorem was published in uh, 1822. Um, and Essentially, what the algorithm says is that we can take an input se sequence in time domain and we can separate that out to its individual components. So each of the components uh, shown on the right hand side, the low frequency component, the high frequency component, each of those components, we can separate them out. We can look at the energies of each of those components. And then also using the inverse Fourier transform, we can take the energies of those um, individual components, sum them back together to recreate the original signal. So it's a reversible transform that we all know as the Fourier transform, but arguably was first developed by Gauss in 1805. If you're interested in mathematical history, that is a fantastic story. I won't go into it today, but I thoroughly recommend doing some reading about it. Okay, so th th that's the basic concept of the Fourier transform. Let's look at the equation. And anyone comfortable with DSP algorithms and equations will be happy with this. Some, some of you guys might look at this and go, oh my God, this is really frightening. But don't be frightened because I'm just gonna talk about the Fourier transform at a high level and then explain how it works. So basically in the Fourier transform, there are, there are two main components. There's the input sequence. Um, and when I teach DSP, I, I always remove the concept of time and frequency because they're interchangeable. So we have a sequence, which is our time sequence but it's a sequence of numbers that we've taken in from our A to D converter. And what we're, all we're going to do is we're going to multiply those numbers by the second sequence. Now, this is a little bit more complex and I'm not going to go into all the details about the complex exponential, but essentially this is just a, an equation which is equal to cos omega t plus j sine omega t. Now, that's again, sounds very complex, but actually let's break it down into its simple components. All we are doing is we're taking our input sequence in time, X of N, and we're multiplying it by, by these components. So we're multiplying X of N by cosine, and we're multiplying the XN sequence by sine, and then we're doing the final operation, which is adding the energy up. So what's this doing if we think about it? Well, actually what this is doing is exactly what was shown in the previous slide. We're multiplying by our sines and cosines of our different frequencies. And then out of this, we're just adding up the energy to get the energy out for each frequency that we are interested in. Now, when I teach at Oxford Uni, I spend three, four, five hours talking about the Fourier transform. So we're covering it in five to 10 minutes. So there's a lot of detail left out, but the really important thing is that all the, the discrete Fourier transform is, is it is a filtering function that is going to take our input sequence, X of N, and it's going to filter it with our, co our coefficients to give us our frequencies of interest, just like the graph on the previous slide. Now, this algorithm is called the discrete Fourier transform. It's the basic algorithm, but it's not the algorithm that we implement because back in the 1950s, a bunch of very, very smart guys realized that they could optimize this algorithm um, and make it run much, much faster and that algorithm is the algorithm that we all know 
as the fast Fourier transform algorithm. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the fast Fourier transform algorithm to basically just take our input sequences in time and convert those from time to frequency and then get the energies at each frequency, just as we saw in the spectrogram in the uh, earlier slide. So um, that's to, uh, to look at it, um, it, it through an the eyes of an equation. Let's just have a, a quick look um, in a sort of graphical data flow type of process that summarizes really how the fast Fourier transform or the DFT works. Again, we've got our input sequence X in time. Um, we put that into our filters. We've got our low pass filter. So this is our, our frequency um, around zero Hertz, F zero. Then we've got a filter, remember the sinusoid uh, gives us our slightly higher frequency here, F2, sorry, F1. Um, and, and we keep doing this. We, we, we basically implement all of these filters and we get all of these different frequencies out. So again, for, for um, engineers and scientists who aren't familiar with the Fourier transform, the, the, the best way of thinking about it is it is a, an algorithm that takes our time domain in input sequence and just, gener just filters the sequencer and generates these band pass outputs. And it's the energy in each of these filter outputs that is the energy that we are going to look at um, with our AI algorithm. So as, as we say, as it says on the slide, the DFT is just a bank of filters and the fast Fourier transform is an optimum, optimized version of that. Okay. Um, so, um, I, uh, Ravi, I've just seen that a question's just come up and um, I, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask it now because this is a, a good time to, to ask it. So, Sure. Uh, Mercia Stan, uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly, expected that DSP processing is lower power than Endolith's neural network method. Curious to know if it's also better or at least similar overall accuracy for the application. Uh, really good question. So actually, um, the, the thing about DSP algorithms, implementing traditional DSP algorithms, is that the accuracy is really dependent on the word length of the algorithm of the device that you're using. So in my case, I was using a 32-bit um, a uh, processor, and that defines the accuracy of the algorithm. Now, in contrast, um, with AI algorithms, the accuracy tends to depend on the training algorithm and the amount of data, the, um, the number of um, uh, hyperparameters, so the input sequence length, the number of hidden layers, the number of layers, uh, 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 sorry, the number of nodes in each layer. And so it depends on all of these parameters. So, um, it's difficult to, to compare the two because uh, you're comparing apples, um, the, the word length, which is the fundamental driving function of DSP accuracy, to uh, a neural network um, hyperparameter complexity, which is the fundamental driving function of, of, of AI. I guess if you've got enough MIPS and enough memory, then you could train an AI algorithm to give you exactly the same accuracy as a 32-bit DSP. Okay, excellent. So um, earlier on, um, Ravi also asked a, a very good question, which was related to speech recognition, because we're all uh, familiar with uh, our um, 
wake word engines in our home devices. I won't say any of those keywords because uh, I don't want to set all your smart devices off in, in your homes. Um, but um, in, in this algorithm, uh, in this application, sorry, um, I have used the pure FFT. Um, and the reason is that um, the, uh, the frequency spectra of rotating machines is much more of a linear spectra. You, you get harmonics, but when the rotating machines are changing frequency, ch sorry, changing rota rotational velocity, um, as that ro rotational velocity changes, that is typically a linear process. You need a linear um, frequency spectra going into your AI algorithm, whereas um, uh, speech is much more of a logarithmic um, uh, signal, signal source to, to recognize. So I did do a little bit of playing around with uh, Mel Kepstrom, uh, uh, particularly MFCCs for, for this application. Um, I, I didn't take it um, to the nth degree of um, comparing every possible option, because basically I found that the fast Fourier transform gave us the results that we needed. But what I did find as a sort of general guidance was that with that Mel Kepstrom, you required a larger fast Fourier transform and the Mel Kepstrom would then reduce that um, FFT output length to a reduced set on, of MFCC coefficients. So you've got a larger FFT, but through the MFCC process, you get a reduced set of coefficients, which you then go on to process. And those coefficients are logarithmically distributed, which fits perfectly with the speech sort of application um, space. Whereas in, thi in this application, uh, because we needed a more linear spectrum uh, to recognize the machine vibration modes at different uh, rotational frequencies, it turned out that um, a shorter FFT would give us a better resolution, frequency resolution um, over that wider range. So that was the trade-off. So it, it, in, that was a, a fairly long answer to a quick question from Ravi, um, at where I'm basically saying that this algorithm is, is great for this type of application but it's not necessarily co correct for something like speech recognition, where a logarithmic spectrum-based approach would be much more appropriate. Okay, so um, let's, uh, let's return to our application. And as I mentioned, we are going to use the fast Fourier transform. And here is the high-level flow diagram of the application. At the top, we've got our analog to digital converter. We're bringing the analog signal into a uh, first stage, which is a threshold and normalization. And you, well, why, what are we doing here? Well, the first stage is um, if, the, uh, if the background signal energy is very, very low, we know that there's no machine turned on, so we don't need to do, do any vibration recognition. So that's a very basic sort of front end switch. If there's no energy, we don't need to do any recognition. But equally, when we were training the models, we had that same switch on. So if, we, if we'd if we recorded a load of data and the engineer that did the recording had left the recording going when there was no machine rotating, we just didn't train them. We, we stopped, paused the training of the model because there was no energy. So that was the thresholding. The normalization um, was an amplitude normalization because we found that um, depending on the setups of the transducers and things, there could be quite a range of uh, energy levels, differences, just for sort of environmental reasons rather than anything specific to do with the vibration mode of the machine. So the, the, the second part of that process was basically normalizing the energy levels for all of the signals regardless. So regardless of the vibration mode, 
all of the signal energies are exactly the same. So all we're looking at is the frequency content, uh, nothing, nothing else. So that was the first stage. Now, the, the second stage um, was, um, was kind of a development of the project because when we first started off, we found that we needed to record quite a lot of time of data uh, to train the, the neural network models, typically 10, 15 minutes of data per mode to train the model. Um, and there were lots of modes that we needed to try and train for different model motors. Uh, and then we thought, well, how can we, um, how can we uh, reduce that, that overall training time, the, the amount of data acquisition required? And we decided to uh, experiment with data augmentation, which is a very common phrase in neural network land. But in this case, basically, if we've got our time domain sequence, which is probably uh, easiest if I draw it, if we've got our time domain sequence, I'll just draw a sort of sinusoidal wave. Basically, we take a frame, which is our frame we're going to process with our FFT and our AI algorithm. And then instead of taking the next frame like this, which we initially started doing, actually with, with the data augmentation, we, we have a kind of a step and then our next frame, they overlap with successive frames. So basically using this approach, we, we can use uh, much shorter amounts of data. Um, and, and in fact, we, we were training at the end, we were training on two minutes of data per mode. So it made it a lot easier for the engineers to, uh, to sample the data from the machines. Um, and then we would, if you like, artificially create more data using this data augmentation overlap process uh, to when we came to train the, the model. Um, of course, we don't use that in the, um, in the um, uh, predicting mode, only when we're, we're fitting the model. Um, okay, so um, that was data augmentation. Then we go into the core DSP algorithms, the window, the fast Fourier transform, the magnitude, and we convert to dB as we saw in the graph. And then finally, we take the output, we do a bit of filtering to, uh, to reduce the noise, and then we put the data into the uh, linear classifier. So those are the, the key six, seven steps um, that we uh, implemented before going into the um, um, standard um, neural network architecture. Now, I, I've got two slides basically on, on convolutional neural networks. I really don't think I need to spend much time on this because, you know, I'm, I'm sure you guys probably wouldn't be here, uh, you know, if, if, if this was brand new to you. Um, but essentially, um, we, we implemented a very standard convolutional neural network. No, nothing complicated, nothing, nothing clever. It just uses standard um, convolutional algorithms. So each, uh, for example, hidden layer node would, would do uh, a convolution of uh, outputs from the input layers and then set the same for our output layer. So we, we only required, or I should say, we only needed to implement a two layer network um, to, to achieve really high levels of classification. Uh, now, the one point that I, I would point out here is that while um, in, in um, AI land, we call this a convolutional neural network, actually each of these operations is actually slightly easier than a convolution operation. It's a dot product. So we'll look at that um, when, we, uh, when we look at the implementation details of our uh, processor. So standard convolutional neural network. And these are, this is a summary, if you like, of the architecture as we implemented it. So the, the uh, system was uh, sampled at, uh, or the, sorry, the vibration signals were sampled at 16 kilohertz. Um, uh, the input layer uh, length for the uh, neural network 
uh, was uh, 128 samples. So this means we need an FFT length of 256 samples because of uh, reflections in the FFT spectra. We're only using the baseband signal. So basically we take 256 samples in, uh, we perform the FFT, but we only take out 128 of those. We don't lose any information. In terms of the hidden layer, we have 25 hidden layer nodes. And then finally, the output layer, we, we could implement as many output uh, layer nodes as there were vibration modes that, that we needed to detect for a specific machine. The only real um, uh, trade-off that um, we needed to, to, to make was the, the um, related to the model accuracy that we see down here, um, the, the requirement to uh, trade for training data in particular, the amount of training data depended on how similar the signals were that we were um, analyzing, i.e. the cross correlation between the, the different signals that we were analyzing. And so one of the things we found was that with the signals we were looking at, we were getting a greater than 99% uh, accuracy uh, for with these hyperparameters. Uh, but when we um, were thinking about the future, we were kind of predicting that if we were going to try and differentiate more closely spaced signals, we might need more input layer nodes, more hidden layer nodes, et cetera, et cetera. But as it is, we achieved that accuracy. The, the model size um, is basically shown here. It's two kilobytes. That's the basic model, plus 500 bytes per additional output category. So the more out vibration modes we want to look at with a with a uh, with the neural network required more data, more MIPS, it's and more memory, obviously. Okay, so that's the hyperparameters. Um, so um, there's a summary. Um, I don't think there's uh, much additional information there. That's a, more of a text. Uh, uh, summary. Oh yes. Well, actually, there was one thing, and this is um, this in the middle here. This sort of rule of thumb, uh, and this is this is not uh, this is not a law of physics. Um, but in my observations, um, I found that um, if we have a single output node, I we're classifying is it a good or a bad signal, then the number of uh, uh, um, hidden nodes um, should be approximately equal to the number of input nodes divided by two. For multiple output nodes, i.e. is it this mode, mode two, mode three, mode four, mode five, then the number of hidden nodes should be equal to the number of input nodes plus the number of output nodes as a rule of thumb. I would always start with those figures and then try increasing the, uh, and decreasing the, the, the size. And actually what we did with the project was I, I just wrote a very simple Python script that, 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 uh, that ran overnight, ra training different models um, and uh, validating the models uh, and trying to optimize that, um, that whole process. So <laughs> the, the algorithm was in C, the training was in C, but the, the sort of rapid that that, that uh, optimized down to a, an optimum result was uh, was written in uh, in Python. Okay, um, a high level slide about hyperparameter complexity. I think you guys probably know um, about hyperparameter complexity. Uh, for uh, one of our tests, here is the uh, confusion matrix uh, that shows. Um, I, don't, I, I can't add up those uh, 582, 773. And you can see in this test with, the, with this machine running with four different vibration modes, we only got four incorrect um, results, uh, incorrectly predicted results out of, I don't know, what's that, 2000 or something like that. So you can kind of 
s judge the the uh, the error result. Okay, uh, one uh, quick note: we looked at um, the uh, spectrogram, um, and a question is: what happens with uh, when uh, the speed of machine varies? And again, this plays to the whole DSP versus AI um, argument. Um, when, uh, rot when the speed of rotating machines varies, it becomes very, very difficult to track frequencies and particularly the harmonics that we are looking at in our, um, in our spectrogram. So there is, a, there is an algorithm called an ordergram which basically takes these varying frequencies we see in the left-hand graph and to convert them into specific points of constant order in the right-hand graph. If, if anybody needs to do that, then that's the way to do it. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's move on to look at how we implemented this uh, system. We actually implemented it on a um, NXP chip um, it's a dual core ARM M33 based uh, processor. You can see the block diagram on the left, but there is a key reason why uh, this was chosen, apart from the fact that uh, the customer had got experience with NXP before. Um, and that is that it includes a DSP coprocessor called the, a power quad. And this allowed us to offload all of the DSP functionality um, from the M33 cores, but also the AI dot product function. So the dot product, as I say, we, we typically refer to it as convolution in a convolutional neural network. It's a dot product, it's a completely standard DSP function. And um, so that we, we also were able to offload um, to the power quad coprocessor. And basically the way it works is you, you store your data in memory for your filtering, windowing, FFT, et cetera. And you just um, tell the power quad, here's the data. This is what I want to do with it. It goes away and does the processing and then um, tells you when, uh, gives you a notification when the data is processed. So it's very, very low power. That's what the power quad's designed for. It's very, very efficient. It allowed us to implement the DSP and the AI algorithms. And um, you know, so low, very, very low power, about 18 milliwatts um, went out of deep sleep. Um, the, the board is shown there, that there's the uh, development board. I've got mine here. It's just got a Wi-Fi module on here uh, as well. Um, okay, so that was, uh, that was the uh, implementation. Um, in this application, and I'm going to show you a demo in the next uh, few seconds, um, we, uh, we just look at vibration modes. But this technique could be used with any, uh, any type of um, you know, uh, useful information from a machine, bearing temperatures, ambient temperature, exhaust gas temperature in a, in a um, gas turbine, for example. Um, uh, we could look at uh, different operating modes, flow rates. In fact, for this application, we had to look at, at uh, rotational uh, operating modes because they in themselves give different vibrations. Uh, so we could, use, we could apply all of these different parameters to this algorithm. We didn't need to uh, use all of these. Um, of course, we could always look for smoke um, that's a pretty good uh, um, uh, good indicator that something's gone wrong. Um, hopefully, we will not be seeing smoke in the demo. So it's demo time. Um, I haven't got. Uh, oh, step back, John. Um, I'm sure many of you guys might want to actually try these algorithms, and the chances are you've probably not got an NXP uh, development board sat on your. Uh, desk, but the chances are you've probably got a Raspberry Pi. Uh, these algorithms will run on a Mac, uh, Windows, Raspberry Pi, uh, any, any uh, device like that. Um, in the right hand side, we see the scatter diagram for the demonstration system that we're going to see now. 
And basically, these are the two modes. Mode zero is, is the good, what we're going to call the good operating mode, and mode one is the bad operating mode. And you can see that there is, a, the, there is no overlap uh, of the points on the left and the points on the right. I'm sure you guys have seen scatter diagrams before. So let's, uh, let's run the demo. And uh, here I've switched to um, a, an additional camera. Uh, my apologies that uh, the, um, the image is a bit blurry. I, um, I bought this camera recently off uh, um, a well-known uh, internet uh, sale um, website. And um, I was, uh, it said 1080p camera, but I'm not entirely sure that it is. Uh, but it, you guys can see what we have in the demo. What we have here is, whoops, I think I've just disturbed my camera. No, it's been working all this time. <laughs> yeah, I'm want to unplug, camera. yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, well, hey, there we go. Oh, there we go. go. Okay, I, I will, I will, I will not disturb. So here we've got a, a little rotating DC machine, um, plugged to a bit of my old Meccano kit from when I was uh, ten years old, and I'm going to rope power up the uh, the DC machine here. Um, over here we've got a Raspberry Pi, and um, basically on here. Um, there's just a little pie hat that's got some LEDs on. There's three LEDs. You can see at the moment they're flashing yellow and red, depending on when I talk. If I stop, and again, I apologize, it's very blurry. If I stop talking, you see they go yellow because that's indicating to the AI algorithm that there's no signal. If I start talking, it's detected a signal, but it says this is not a good vibration mode. Uh, so we'll, we'll, go red. So what we're going to see now with the, with this machine, I'll turn the rotating machine on, the, the DC machine, and you can see that the uh, LEDs are glowing red. Um, that's not good. It's not a good, good mode. But what happens if I lift it off the desk? Hold on. The LEDs have gone green. They're red when I talk. And basically, all this, you can probably hear the difference subtly. I'll stop talking in a minute. When the, the um, machine is on the desk, it's causing some vibration. Uh, and that is being detected by the AI algorithm as the, as the bad vibration mode. But when I lift it up, then it's, uh, it's saying, oh, that's good vibration mode. So good. Bad. So uh, there's actually a question about this. Uh, you know, how did you generate deterministic faults, and how was the baseline data collected? So in this particular example, it looks like your, uh, you know, good and bad are basically about placing it on the desk or off the desk. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so okay. Yeah. Good question, Ravi. Thank you. So basically, this demo, you can download the code. The links at the end of this presentation. You can download the code. You can train a model to recognize different vibration machine modes. You can train it on your washing machine or your dishwasher or your microwave. Um, and uh, but here, just for this demo, because it was really easy for me to do it, I just trained it on those two vibration modes with with that motor. Um, the actual system had many more modes. It, it was nothing like this. It, in fact, it, it used a, um, uh, a proper um, transducer, not, not just a microphone and so on. So Sorry. actually, just one final and point. The microphone I'm using is this USB microphone from Exmos. Um, perfect. That, that is another question. By the way, in, in, uh, another question re relating to the data is uh, typically uh, the anomalous operating modes uh, the data is much sparser than the normal operating mode. So how do you deal with that uh, in terms of data balance? Um, sorry, say that again, Ravi. It's, uh... So uh, usually anomalous data is much rarer or much sparser in your data set. Ah, yeah, typically. yeah. I, actually, that, that is a very good point. And actually, yes, we, we had that problem uh, at the start of the project because we were getting very, very 
high accuracy results for predicting successful operation and not very good results for predicting bad operation. And it turned out that that was exactly the problem that we saw. So basically we just had to, that, that, part of the solution to that was the data augmentation that I mentioned earlier. So the data augmentation massively helped with that problem. Uh, go ahead. I, there are some more questions I'll ask them at the end. Yeah, so basically that's pretty much it. There's, there's a few extra slides that I've got, which are additional points of note for the project. Um, so basically, uh, in conclusion, I would say um, it's really key to think about your the requirements of your project. I like to think about it as intelligent AI, thinking about how you're going to process the data, what kind of data that you've got, how to use it. Experiment with feature engineering. We actually, in this application, we spent more time experimenting with the feature engineering than with the AI algorithms. Um, here is um, some links to um, additional uh, resources. Uh, Pete's book is listed there. I think we've all used that to um, uh, to to uh, to learn uh, AI from, and um, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, great, uh, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, thank you very much, John, for for the great talk. Uh, um, you know, there are a few more questions. Uh, we've been uh, answering a few uh, as we went. Uh, so you mentioned that CMCSNN and TensorFlow Lite were at their infancy at the start of this project. Uh, when you, uh, if you kind of look back at this now, uh, how would you uh, use them or like how they integrate into the, the DSP part of this? Uh, that, 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 that's a great question. Yeah, so, so basically when we started the, the, the TensorFlow Lite was, uh, was, was becoming, uh, you know, was becoming more and more uh, amazing in what it did. And now we've got TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. So what happened was we, we um, we kind of we didn't know exactly what device we would be targeting, but we knew it would have some DSP capabilities. So we targeted the DSP capabilities for the algorithms, including the dot product for the convolutional neural network. And that the actual C code for that is only about ten lines of C code for um, um, a, 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 com a CNN predictor. It's very very short piece of C code. So we wrote that, and it was working. Um, but then actually, once you've written that, the additional lines of code to, to write the, uh, the training function, the fit, fit function, it, it is again only about twice as much code. So it's only about another 10 lines of C code. So we right. kind of- But on the inference it. side? Um, yeah, 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 exactly. So, so, so the inferencing uh, model uh, uh, function is about 10 lines of C code. And, and the, the fitting function is about 20 lines of C right. code. So we started uh, with that. Now, of, of course, in this application, because of the capabilities of this processor that we're using with the power quad, you know, we kind of really optimized it for that DSP capability. I, I don't know the capability of CMSIS NN for this type of targeted device. If we were to start now, I would I would definitely do all of the training using uh, Colab and the TPUs, which are fantastic. I'd output a flat me flat model, um, uh, flat memory model, uh, and use that in my C code. Um, oh. um, and then I'd look to see how much of TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers and CMSIS NN I could actually use. Um, uh, alongside the, the core DSP algorithms. But yeah, we would take a very different approach nowadays. And you know, actually one, one day, if I get a rainy day when I get some time on my hands, ha ha, um, I will actually uh, go back to doing some of the training right. using Colab um, because I think it, um, down the line, we will certainly be using that for, for this product. Got it. Uh, uh, one last question, I realize we're already five minutes over. Uh, uh, one last question is, uh, do you have a, uh, a profiling of 
which part of this pipeline, like you mentioned various steps, right? Bringing from time domain data to, to frequency spectrum, to feature extraction, to the NN model. Uh, which part of this uh, was the most expensive in terms of uh, latency or power consumption? Is that something that you had uh, profiled? Yeah, absolutely. So actually it turns out that the DSP algorithms themselves are the most computationally expensive parts of the algorithm. And actually, uh, Ravi, I have seen somebody ask another question related to this. They said, um, uh, um, what did they say? They said, oh, did we remove the mean before um, performing the FFT? Right. And the que answer to, to uh, uh, that question was absolutely yes. So yeah. the, the DSP algorithms, the FFT particularly, was the one that took the most MIPS and um, um, it's um, that yes, by a long way. The, the the AI algorithm actually is really really simple. As I said, it's only about ten lines of C code um, to run it on the Raspberry Pi. Okay, so right. um, Ravi, uh, just one last thing, if I, if you don't mind me saying, mm -hmm. uh, because this is the very last um, session of the year. Uh, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to you, obviously, as the host. Uh, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Olga for arranging all of these events throughout the year in difficult times. It's been pretty amazing what the, the TinyML uh, team have done. Um, so thank you very much. If anyone's interested in downloading the code, you can get it from that link. Um, and uh, I think that's about it. Oh, yeah, one last thing. I do need to thank uh, a guy called Brendan Slade at NXP for helping me make all this work. So. Thank you to everyone and um, yes, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Over to you, Ravi. Yep, thank you very much, John. And uh, you know, the remaining questions, we'll be posting it on the uh, TinyML forums. So please uh, you know, do visit the forums after your talk to see if there are any more questions from the audience that you can continue the conversation over there. All right. Um, Uh, we'd like to thank our uh, TinyML Talk sponsors again, ARM, our TinyML strategic partner, DeepLight, Edge Impulse, Maxim Integrated, Kixo, Reality AI, and SimSense. Oh, uh, slides got faster. Uh, one second. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, here we go. All right. Uh, ARM, uh, a strategic TinyML partner. Uh, ARM provides software and hardware foundations for TinyML. DeepLight, using AI to make other AI faster, smaller, and more efficient. Edge Impulse provides uh, TinyML tools uh, for uh, all developers. Uh, get your free account at edgeimpulse.com. Maxim Integrated, enabling edge intelligence. Check out the new Max 78,000, which impl implements AI inferences at over 100x lower energy than other embedded options. Now the edge can see and hear like never before. Kixo AutoML for embedded AI, automated machine learning platform that builds tiny ML solutions for the edge using sensor data. Reality AI, providing reality uh, AI solutions in automotive sound recognition and localization, indoor, outdoor sound, event recognition, and reality check voice anti-spoofing. And SynSense, uh, SynSense builds ultra low power sensing and inference hardware for embedded mobile and edge devices. Uh, just a reminder, our next TinyML talk is on Tuesday, January 5th. I hope you liked uh, the new format uh, of having one speaker per TinyML talk session so that we can go into a lot more detail and also have a lot more interactive and answering more questions during the talk. Uh, please uh, write back to us uh, at Talks at TinyML or in the forum about your comments about the new format. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for a great year uh, with TinyML Talks, and wish you uh, happy and safe holidays and a happy new year 2021. Thank you.